what's in the box. Today's item, of course. I'll let you have a good look at it after I tell you its secret. I'm sure the dead will rest better once the secret is out. Morrison was once a customer, just like you. And he's dying for you to hear this one. You're back, and with two more coins, no less. Good, but I warn you, today's secret is not for the faint of heart. Morrison's in a financial bind as of recently. He needs to make enough money by the end of the day, or else the sharks he loaned from will smell his blood. He decides that he should sell off a portion of the drugs he has left, his drug of choice being fentanyl. He decides to try to sell to someone he knew struggled with it in the past. A woman who had overcome her addiction during her days in rehab. Morrison was sure he could still convince her to buy some off him. She was living in a relatively average area of town, not particularly rich or struggling. Morrison drives to her house. A short moment later, she opens the door. She looks at Morrison suspiciously. What are you doing here? One last hit won't hurt. You'd be helping a friend through a tough time. Morrison offers the drugs. She nervously looks back into her home before eyeing the drug. She cautiously holds her hand out. Morrison brings his hand back. You'll need to pay for it. The door closes. Time passes. And Morrison wonders if he should leave. The door creaks open and she lets him in. I took my child into my bedroom. She hands him some cash. Morrison hands the drugs over to her in exchange. As she starts using fentanyl, she looks at him. Please stay. Make sure nothing bad happens. Morrison waves his hand in a yeah yeah manner while he looks down at the cash. He is nervously pacing around her house. He had not gotten enough money from the exchange. Morrison looks around her house, approximating the cost and weight of each item. As well as the shape, he desires something that might be easy to carry. After he selects some items of value that are reasonable to carry out, he snatches them. Some nice looking objects he knows he could pawn for a good price. One item of notice he now has in his possession is a baby rattle. On his way out, he sees her. It's clear she's overdosing. Her lips and fingers are blue. Her body was seized up, and she was hardly breathing. Gurgling could be heard. He knows that he should get her help, but he needs these objects to make his deadly deadline. If he caught someone here, he would only be in trouble. He runs out, finds a pawn shop, sells the objects, and takes his money. When it is time, he pays the people he owes. It is until after he makes his payment that the reality of his actions are apparent. He goes to look for someone who will be able to help him. Morrison meets with a guy who occasionally sells him fentanyl. I'm gonna get busted for doing a bad thing. You've gotta help me. The rugged looking man, covered in tattoos, paces around his living room. The floor is a mess of kicked up dust and used to needles. Okay, okay. Just don't say anything about it here. I think I know of someone who can help. Huh. <sighs> Great. Who is it? His dealer leaves into another room and quickly comes back with a coin. Here, take this. Go to Treasured Memories, then ask the store owners for the broker. The who? The secret keeper. He can help with your problems there. Now go. Morrison makes his way to the broker, the broker that hides in the back of the old store. That mystery of a building still smells of charcoal. He steps in and sees the shopkeepers. The two crazy guys were monkeying with some unique vintage props. He asks to see the secret keeper. They both stop in their tracks and point to the back door. When Morrison turns his back, they continue goofing off with some possibly rare and mostly breakable oddities. He opens the blackened door. In a dimly candlelit room, sitting in the back was the secret keeper, a surprisingly younger and smaller man than expected, wearing a vest. Morrison holds out a mysterious coin into the flickering candlelight. The reflections and shimmer of the coin catches the attention of the broker immediately. I heard you help people with problems? Then you heard wrong. People make deals, trade one thing for another. Most, however, want my more specified service, to keep a secret. What does that do? They come in here with a coin in hand, just like yours. They give them to me and a secret they want kept, and just like that, it's gone. The only ones who will know are those part of the secret. And that works? Every time. Morrison hands the coin to him. I want no one to know. 
I got a woman to overdose before stealing from her house, causing her child to be alone. The secret keeper accepts the coin, placing it in storage with the others behind him. No one will ever know the secret of her deadly overdose, the looting of her house, and the demise of her orphaned child. What? I imagine you would prefer to have realized that information sooner than later. <laughs> so it's done? Your secret is only with you and the dead. And of course myself. The secret keeper says, putting his hand to his chest. Morrison walks out, closing the door behind himself. He looks to the two shopkeepers who have finished fiddling around with well-aged knickknacks. They offer selling some of their trinkets, and of course a t-shirt. Morrison waves a hand, indicating that he has no desire to purchase such needless things. When he is out, Morrison takes a breath of air. He is in the clear. He gets in his car and drives home. He walks down the path to his front door, then after a long day, takes a rest on his couch. He puts on the TV, something to act as white noise while he falls asleep. His nap is interrupted by the high pitch of infantile crying. He wakes up and searches for the root of the now ear-bleeding whine. It leads Morrison into his bathroom, where he sees the body of the woman lying on the ground, vomit in her mouth and along the floor. Her fingertips appear blue. He looks in the medicine cabinet. The only thing in it is fentanyl, packaged the same way he gave it to her. He rapidly blinks. His house returns to its normal state and the crying ceases. Morrison couldn't stop thinking about her after that. He decides that he should check on her, to at least make sure nothing worse has happened. Maybe her body was discovered and her child saved. He can't shake the eerie idea that something bad has happened after what that broker had said. He goes outside, makes his way back to her house and enters. Her body is still there, unattended. Morrison feels guilty that her body hasn't been put to rest. He makes his way around the house. He is deafened by the crying of an infant. Morrison covers his ears, then makes his way to see if he is not too late. When he enters, he sees that her child did not survive being unattended. Morrison realizes the true weight of his actions. He has created a chain of events that left two others deceased. Overwhelmed by guilt, he knew he had to atone for what he caused. He runs out into the police station. Morrison points to the nearest officer. You there. Arrest me. The policewoman ignores him and passes by. Morrison catches up with the officer. I sold drugs to a woman. She overdosed and is dead. Her child was with her and perished as well. Can you punish me now? <laughs> yeah, and where is this supposed body of the victim? On the floor of her house. She lives on 176 McIntyre Street. <laughs> At least when you lie, you think of a few details. Just go look at it. Here, I'll take you to the pawn shop and show you exactly what I stole from her. Oh, so now you stole things from her house too? Sure that happened. He makes his way to the other officer. I've done a horrible thing. Here, I'll show you the guy I buy fentanyl from. He tries to get the officer to follow him. Are you crazy? Get out of here unless you have something actually serious. Do I look like I want to have my time wasted? Morrison knew he had to be punished for what he did. He did not want to provoke the officers to arrest him for something else. If he did, then the woman and her child would only be bones to bury. Morrison takes to the streets. Morrison grabs the first stranger he sees. He pulls the person's arm in the direction of where his crimes are. The stranger pulls the hand out of his grasp before quickly walking the opposite direction. Morrison then hears an auditory illusion created by his tormented mind. He hears the soft, faint rattling. The sound increases in volume, second by second. The grating noise sends him spiraling far beyond the threshold of sanity. Morrison pleads to anyone who passes by. Please, please listen. I killed a woman. I gave her fentanyl. Not a single person pays any attention. He gets on his knees and starts yelling to block out the sound of the baby rattle. She's dead. Her child is dead. I need you to listen to me. Everyone circles him, passing, 
Some look, others don't. No one would pay any attention to what he would say to them if it had anything to do with the overdosed woman and her child. Without anything else to do, Morrison decides to go back to the secret keeper. Somehow tried to get a refund. Morrison ignores the shopkeepers. So did you reconsider making a purchase? Or... Oh, I guess you haven't. Morrison knocks the door open with his shoulder, then approaches the secret keeper. You cursed me. Curses? Hexes? Do you think I'm a warlock? Or a witch? Whatever you did, take it back. Take it back now. I am unable to do that. You can choose to read my lips or my sign. The secret keeper raises his cane and hits the hanging sign above him. All transactions are final. Morrison exits the building. It is now night. Outside he sees a mysterious stranger in the dark. Don't bother making deals with that clown. I have a better offer. You look burdened with information. Want to forget about something? Right? Make all the pain go away? Morrison thinks about this. The horror that will await him if he doesn't do something. Yes. Is there something you can do? That depends. Will you give me your soul in return? Morrison considers this, weighing the torment he feels with the ominous proposition made to him. If he remembers the horrible thing he is trapped in an endless torment, unable to escape the memory of what he did, never truly being condemned for something he more than deserves. The only bad thing about this is that the woman and her child would still never be found. No peace or closure. But if he took this deal, he would forget all about that. As he thinks, the rattling returns. Worse than ever. Soon joined by the screaming of a child in need. The symphony of torture reaches its opus. With the introduction of the gurgling woman dying, he holds his hands over his ears, but nothing can make it muffle. Yes, you can have my soul now. Take it away. The figure guides Morrison by the back, walking him to the curb. Very well. You won't remember a thing. It'll be as if it never happened. In the night, the only lights are coming from the moon, the street light, and a speeding car. The figure rips Morrison's heart out before pushing him with the other hand in front of the headlights. The car swerves in a panic, leaving a mark on the road in the shape of a bloody S. The shady figure walks away, tucking Morrison's bleeding vital organ into his coat. You look shaken. Let's hope the baby's cries don't haunt you like they did Morrison. But that's what he gets when he doesn't pay the full price for my assistance. Even though I'm located in the back of a pawn shop, this isn't some cheap charity event I run here. Bargains come at a price. Every item in here has a secret. With enough coins, you get every secret you desire. Join me early tomorrow for a more lighthearted secret about Herman and his favorite place for breakfast, Wicked Brew.